Just a short time ago, Edmonton featured on the amazing race and they took the contestants to our dump and to a gas station. Did that grind your gears a little bit? Well, I didn't actually see it, uh, but I did hear concerns from people that uh, of all the different things we might have shown off, those wouldn't be on the top of everyone's list. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, I have a perspective on this as, uh, you know, having been on city council, having led our environment initiative, having chaired our utility committee, which I sometimes call the poop and garbage committee. I, I am amazingly passionate about what we do with waste management in the city. And world class is an awful cliche that you hear a lot of local politicians use. And you'll hear me use it very seldom, except when I'm referring to what we do, not at the dump. Now it's the waste management center where we uh, you know divert through composting and through recycling and through uh, now this biofuel system that's coming online uh, aiming for 90 percent diversion from the landfill when most of our neighbors are still digging holes in the ground and and shoving garbage in there so it is actually something very cool I'm maybe amazing race didn't do it justice because they went by so fast but uh, I'm, I'm certainly proud of that uh, but if they come back next time we'll make sure they see the river valley make sure they see uh, uh, the downtown and and all the stuff that we're excited about in addition to our world-class waste management system. I know a lot of people read your blog at donivison.ca. You've recently written about infill housing. I have a question here for a listener. Uh, it says, can, can you please ask the mayor how replacing one single family home with two skinny homes that'll sell for $1.2 million will help provide affordable housing? Examples in Lansdowne and Aspen Gardens. Well, I'm glad the I'm glad the person's written in about that. Uh, I mean, that's just a little part of our overall infill and densification strategy, which is designed to increase the efficiency of the infrastructure and over time reduce the cost for all of us as taxpayers and utility ratepayers of living in a city. And density helps us do that. And so, um, there's an affordability upside for all of us when we replace one unit with two units. And that's one of the reasons why councils approved that uh, that opportunity for subdivision. Now, I haven't heard of a skinny house for 1.2 million yet, but I've heard of lots of 50-foot lots ha- having their old affordable post-war semi-bungalow uh, ripped down and replaced by a 3,000-square-foot monster house for $1.8 million, which is not necessarily affordable. Uh, in some of those neighborhoods where we've allowed for this uh, a lot subdivision in these quote unquote skinny homes to be built, uh, you know, they're still maybe 500 or 600 or 700,000 bucks, uh, depending on how much granite they have in them. But that is a hell of a lot more affordable than the, the 1.3, 1.4, 1.8 uh, million dollar mega house. And so it, it is, relatively speaking, not just more affordable in terms of uh, the purchase price, but it is more affordable for the city in the long term to have two families on that land paying taxes rather than uh, one family continuing to be on that land. So there is a business case for why we're doing this. Now, obviously, the major gains in the long term are uh, uh, in terms of uh, transit-oriented development around LRT stations, apartments along uh, you know, avenues where you would have higher frequency transit. And we're not proposing to put that kind of density into neighborhoods like Lansdowne and Aspen Gardens because there isn't high frequency transit nearby. So people can rest easy about that. But it's uh, not a profound change to the character of the neighborhood to have uh, two single family houses where there was previously one. And that's that's why council has supported that change. First Capital Realty and Sun Life Investment are developing the brewery district. Of course, that the brewery castle there on 104th needs, well, it's achieved protection by the city. It's a municipal heritage building. The developers, though, want $4.2 million towards the restoration project. They say it should be written into the city's budget. We have no leverage on it now. Why wasn't this part of the original negotiation for Brewery District? Well, it... it, If it had been up to me, it would have been part of the discussion about the zoning, and it would have been included in in the performa discussions, but uh, that that didn't occur at the time, uh, so we have to deal with it this way. Now, this is not inconsistent with how we would deal with other heritage properties, and you go back to the very first building that we designated um, uh, which, as a city, which was the McDonald Hotel, when it was at risk of coming down, and the city put, I think, one and a half million dollars uh, into that back in the 80s, now much larger building, but you think about how much further one point some million dollars would go today than it did early in the 80s and there's so there's precedent for the city stepping in and uh, investing and and the idea is that 
you have to compensate um, a landowner if they agree not to tear something down and develop something more valuable. And so we do the same thing with uh, heritage homes. Uh, we have a, a you know a small budget for those incentives, and uh, this would wipe not, out the fund, though. Well, but we're seeing you know as the city ages uh, and and increasing pressure and expectation, whether it's McDougal United Church or the Artery, their graphic arts building, or other heritage homes in Glenora and Highlands and other neighborhoods that are getting to that age where they're at risk of coming down, that the city is going to have to pay um, uh, pay to play to maintain heritage, and so this is not inconsistent with that trend that we're seeing, and. And I think, you know, it is worth preserving because it's an extraordinary building. It's also a very weird building, which makes preserving it very expensive because it it's essentially an industrial building. It's not just, uh, a, you know, an office that you can convert to lofts. It's, it's pretty weird in there. So it's going to take some dough, but uh, I think it will add a lot to the city. And if we make the investment, we'll look back on it and go, thank goodness we did. You've just announced that the city of Edmonton will name a park in South Terwilliger after fallen constable Dan Woodall. You showed your emotion, you wore your heart on your sleeve the morning after he was killed in the line of duty. Why was this a priority for you, Mr. Mayor? Well, I think, you know, especially so that uh, his family and his colleagues and his community can have a place to go and gather in remembrance. I, I know that how important that's been for the Ferone family to have Ezio Ferone Park. And shortly after uh, Dan was killed, um, we gathered actually at the 25th anniversary of of uh, Ezio's death, um, and I, you know, I met his mother, I met his siblings, uh, I met his kids, and uh, um, you know, it's uh, it's important to have that gathering space, and important for us to all remember that significant sacrifice that uh, that our first responders make, um, putting themselves in in harm's way, and and um, and it, it's going to have. Uh, you know, sports fields too, and and I know that that was a big part of Dan's life. So every time someone plays soccer there, you know, it'll honor him. So it's good. I like that you wear your heart on your sleeve. I can't help it. I'm a big softy. <laughs> Is it okay that I tell people your eyes are a little misty right now? Sure. The real deal, Mayor Don Iveson.